Welcome back, princes and princesses of the Most High. This is part three of Christ, my Passover. And before we dive into our study, pause the video and have a prayer to ask the Holy Spirit to guide your mind into truth and to understand his word. Now let's review. In the last video, we saw that the 70 weeks begins with Artaxerxes. And we also saw that the start of the 70 weeks begins in the seventh month. We saw that these little details are building a foundation that is strong and that each little detail is like a rebar to reinforce that strength. Do you remember discussing how to determine if you are correctly applying Bible prophecy? First, we need to identify every meaning for the symbol we are using. Then we need to plug that meaning in to find out if it fits. If it lines up with history, does not contradict anywhere else in the Bible, does not contradict the laws of nature, and makes good sense, then we have put in the correct application. To check ourselves to make sure our application is correct, by looking at history, we also want to compare scripture to see if it makes sense. If the symbol is our puzzle piece, we don't want to force it into the prophecy if it doesn't fit. This causes damage to the idea and to scripture. By comparing scripture with scripture to make sure our idea is not contradicting anywhere else in the scripture is very important. Contradicting the laws of nature and making good sense go together. Contradicting the laws of nature would be like the prophecies in the Bible where you have weird-looking beasts. These are symbols, and if I decide to take the literal application by stating a four-headed leopard will be seen coming out of water, it doesn't really make sense, and it contradicts nature. You don't see four-headed leopards in nature. In order to understand, we would need to find all the symbols this beast represents, plug them in, and see which one fits. When applying our hypothesis in this video, we are going to use the guidelines just given to make sure we are correctly applying our puzzle pieces. The last thing we are going to review is why we are starting the 70-week prophecy at the seventh month. One is because it naturally takes time to start something once you get to the location. It would take Ezra time to settle into Jerusalem when arriving in the fifth month. The second reason is more biblically sound. The sanctuary was the center of Jewish economy. And to look at restoration connected to the sanctuary would make sense. The prophecy could not start with the building of the sanctuary only but also the restoring of the sanctuary and of the nation's ability to govern themselves. Where we saw the restoration and the building process was with Artaxerxes. Therefore, we start with Artaxerxes' decree to begin the 70 weeks. Artaxerxes commanded that the magistrates and judges be set up to govern and rule according to the law of God. The king also commanded that Whatever is needed for the services of God be given to Ezra. Here we have a command to build and also to restore. The key is restoration, to govern according to the law of God. One of the ceremonial laws was to keep the Day of Atonement, which would be the next feast following the time Ezra came to Jerusalem. Along this theme of restoration, the next service having to do with restoration was indeed the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is about restoration and cleansing of the sanctuary and the people. It is with the Day of Atonement that the people find restoration from sin. It is with the Day of Atonement that by the purging of sin they are restored back to the connection with God. And this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls, and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country, or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, 
to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you, to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Now that we have seen how the Day of Atonement restored the people from their sins, we can find out when it is by looking at our calendar. We figured out from the last video that Ezra arrived at Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was sometime in August to September. Now let's find out when the tenth day of the seventh month would be, since that is when we are hypothesizing our beginning date. From this calendar we see the fifth month, that would mean the sixth month would be from September to October, and the seventh month would be from October to November. Whenever the new moon began in October would be the first day of the seventh month. Then we go ten days from the new moon, and we find the tenth day of the seventh month. Now let's see what happens if we plug in our symbols. The four symbols we saw for time were literal, a day for a year, day for a thousand years, or an unknown time. We know that the indefinite time doesn't work because the prophecy tells us the time, 70 weeks. Let's see if the day for a thousand years works. Christ is our guidepost. The prophecy says that the Messiah will come after the 62 weeks. If we use the symbol, a day for a thousand years, what will that take us to? To answer this question, we need to find out how many days are in 69 weeks. How many days are in one week? Yes, seven. Now we have to take 69 weeks and multiply that by seven days in a week, and we get 483. Are you asking yourself, why am I multiplying by 69 weeks instead of 62 weeks, since the prophecy said after the 62 weeks? If so, then let me explain. The prophecy is giving us directions how to get to the Messiah. But those directions are in numbers instead of symbols. For example, if you were going to a friend's house and getting directions, they might say, to get to my house, you are going to go seven miles, and at the seven mile mark, you are going to see a blue house. Then you're going to go 62 miles, and you will see a yellow house. After that 62 miles, you will see my house, which is the yellow house. How many miles was it to your friend's house? It was 69 miles. You have to count the miles you took from the start point, not the guidepost they gave you along the way. It is the same with this prophecy. We see Christ after that second guidepost, but we still have to count the miles from the starting point. That would be 483 days by counting the days from 7 weeks and the 62 weeks. Now, if we took that and said each day was a thousand years, that means we would have to take 483 times a thousand, which equals 483,000. If we plug that into our start date of 457 BC, that would take us to the year AD 482,543. We are in the year 2019. That would mean we have a really long way off before we would see the Messiah. That symbol does not fit because Christ has already come and died for us. So the symbol for a thousand years as a day does not work. It contradicts history and scripture. Let's try the literal application. Did the Messiah come after 483 literal days? In order to answer this question, we need to find out how many days are in a biblical year. From the first video, we saw that there are 30 days in a month, and according to Revelation, there are 12 months in a year. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, 
and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This tree has twelve manner of fruit, and each month it is bringing forth a new fruit. This tells us that there are twelve months in a year. If there are thirty days in a month and twelve months in a year, we would take twelve times thirty, and that equals three hundred and sixty days in one year. There are 360 days in a biblical year. That means 483 days would equal one year and 123 days, which would mean we should see the Messiah one year and 123 days after Artaxerxes gave his decree in 457 BC. Well, this doesn't fit either because it was over 400 literal years later that the Messiah was born. So far we have tried the indefinite time, the day for a thousand years, and the literal day. The only one we have left is the day for a year. Let's see if that works. If we take the 483 days and say that they are years starting at 457, that would take us to 26 AD. This is the exact time in which Christ was alive. So far it works. We are exactly at a time where Christ was on earth. Let's dig a little more into the minds of God's word and history to see if other aspects of the prophecy are fulfilled. Reading the prophecy again, we find the first stop in the prophetic numbers is the seven weeks. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Something significant must happen at the seven weeks. Seven weeks would be 49 days by taking seven days in a week and multiplying it by seven weeks. If we use the day for a year principle, the 49 days would be 49 years. There must be something significant 49 years after 457 BC. What date would that be? If we take 457 and move down the timeline 49 years, that would take us to 408 BC. Did anything happen in 408 BC? That was when the work in Jerusalem was finished. We find the proof of this statement when we connect scripture and history. First, let's find out who was king in 408 BC in order to see if the events in the Bible line up with history. We see the year 408 BC lines up just before the reign of Artaxerxes II. Therefore, Darius II would be the king ruling in 408 BC when the wall was finished. Nehemiah asked the king to go to Jerusalem in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes. The reason was because Nehemiah found out that the walls of Jerusalem were still destroyed. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes, the king, that the wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? The king granted the request of Nehemiah to go and help build the walls of the city. We find in the book of Nehemiah that he mainly focuses on the last portion of the building process. We read that he came to Jerusalem and then went back to the king in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes. And then after some time, he went back to Jerusalem. It was after this some time that the work was finished. So how do we find out when that time was? To answer that question, we need to go to some other books of the Bible and history. Perdot, a famous historian, marks Nehemiah's second reformation in 408 BC. This means that the temple and the wall was finished during the second reformation or the second visit of Nehemiah. It was during that second trip back when the work was finished 
because it took only 52 days to complete the work. So the wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month Elul, in fifty and two days. Fifty and two days is fifty-two. The work was completed in a very short time. We can also come to this conclusion by combining other Bible texts and history. Haggai and Zechariah were both prophets that lived during the time of Nehemiah. Both were given instruction of the Lord. In their books we find that during the time of Darius II, the walls were still not built. In the second year of Darius the king, and the sixth month, and the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shelatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? We read that the Lord's house is still lying waste, and the people have coverings on their houses. The wall would be a covering for the temple. It would protect it, and it is still not completed. The Lord had to send a message through Haggai for the people to stop building on their own houses and finish his work. They thought it wasn't time to finish the work, but God is telling them it is time. This was during the time of Darius, not Artaxerxes. How do we know that it was Darius II and not Darius I? We know because the people that are alive in the story of Haggai are the people that were alive during the time of Artaxerxes I. Specifically, Zerubbabel is a clue for us in this case. We see Zerubbabel in the book of Nehemiah during Artaxerxes, and then he is still alive during Darius. We call this contemporary, meaning he lived the same time. This would have to be Darius II because Zerubbabel would be much too old if it were the time frame of Darius I. In Zechariah we read, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Cheslu. It is the fourth year of Darius II when Zechariah hears a word from the Lord. Reading the following chapters, you will find that the Lord talks about many things, and one of those promises he gives is he will fight for his people. Remember that the wall was going to be built in troublous times. Here is a promise in the fourth year of Darius II that the Lord is going to be there for his people. Let's go back to Nehemiah and see if the wall was built in troublous times. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth. From these texts we see that there were people who did not want to see the work finished, and in order to complete the work, they had to set up watchmen day and night. One of those key players was Sambalot, who did not want the work finished. The workers had to do the work with one hand and hold on to their sword with the other. This was indeed troublous times, and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. They which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens, with those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other held to his weapon. Sambalot was a ruler of Samaria, whose daughter was married to the grandson of the high priest Eliashib, and one of the sons of Joida, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sambalot, the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Nehemiah kicks out the son of Jehoiada from ministering in the sanctuary because he did not follow God's laws and was married to a Samaritan, someone who is outside of the faith. During that time, the Samaritans were involved in false worship. 
The key point for this prophecy is that Sambalot was ruling and causing trouble with a work. We find the last bit of the work was finished in a short time, 52 days to be exact. So the wall was finished in the 20th and 5th day of the month of Elul, in 50 and 2 days. Therefore the work was completed at the time Sambalot was ruling, and Sambalot ruled in 408 BC. We know Sambalot ruled in 408 because of the discovery of the Elfantine Papri. The Elfantine Papri is a name to describe many documents, one of which was found in the early 1900s from an Egyptian border fortress. The information from these papri span over a thousand years. One of the documents date back to 408 BC and mentions Sambalot as a governor of Samaria and also mentions Johanan, the son of Eliash Eliashib. So far we have seen that Darius II ruled during the time the walls were being built. Nehemiah and Sambalot lived at the same time and Sambalot governed Samaria in 408 BC. During this time the work on the wall was finished in a short time. Around the same time or shortly after Nehemiah removes Joadah's son and the Elfantine Papri dating back to 408 BC mentions Sambalot and Johanan, Joadah's brother, who is a son-in-law to Sambalot. All of this is very likely could have happened in 408 BC. This information though does not bring us to the exact date. We just know that all of this happened at the same time. But what time did this occur? Here was one more piece of evidence to show that it was indeed 408 when the temple in Jerusalem was completed and all these events took place. We find this evidence from the vision the Lord gave Zechariah. Zechariah had a vision of an ephah, which is a measure of grain. Probably a basket was used as a way to measure, just like we use measuring cups. Then he sees a piece of lead. He is told it represents a woman and wickedness. The lead is put into a basket, and out come two women. Zechariah asks what these represent, and the answer is, and he said unto me to build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established, and set there upon her own base. This vision is obviously symbolic, because it does not go along with the laws of nature. A basket flying with two women coming out of it is not real. So we need to figure out what the symbols mean. You can pause the video and look up these texts to see that in the Bible, a woman can represent a church. And the Bible says these are wicked women or, or a wicked church. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. Shinar is the place where the rebellious people after the flood built the Tower of Babel. Shinar is a plain in Babylon and Babylon represents a place of wickedness. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. This vision has a fulfillment in the last days, but it also is pertinent to the time of Zechariah. You have these two women representing churches. We often think of a church as a building, but the church actually represents a body of people and their beliefs. This concept is seen in Acts. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. The people leading Egypt were called a church. There was no building for them to meet in yet when they spoke to Jehovah on Mount Sinai. Even though there was no building or sanctuary, yet they were still called a church. We call a place of worship a church, but the Bible calls it a house. We see this in Ezra, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. 
Zechariah has a vision of a false or wicked system of worship, building a house or a place of worship. He actually sees two of these women. Was there a false place of worship built during Zechariah's time? Two of them? Yes. In fact, history tells us that Sambalot received permission from Darius to build a temple on Mount Gerizim. Historians say that he was undoubtedly jealous of the temple that was just completed and wanted one of his own. We read from Nehemiah that Sambalot didn't think they were going to be able to complete the work and mocked the Jews. At this time, the Samaritans were still practicing idolatry, a false worship. This is one of the houses going up in Zechariah's vision, but then there is another one that went up in Egypt that can be found in the Elephantine Papyri. The Elephantine Papyri show that Sambalot was sought out for aid in the building of this temple. Remember that the document dates to the year 408 BC, and in 408 BC was the request made. It has been said that the Jews in the Elephantine mixed the true and the false religion in their worship. We have two houses requesting to be built at the same time the work is finished in the Lord's house. I want you young people to recognize that Satan always has a counterfeit for the true and will always try to make distractions to keep truth muddled. This is exactly what the Lord foretold to Zechariah. Two false houses would rise up, and they did during the time the Lord's house was finished. Both involved the same Sambalot who was opposing the Lord's house. All of the events in Nehemiah surrounding the building of the sanctuary were part of the Second Reformation and happened very quickly at the same time because the work was done very quickly in 52 days. From these events and what the El Fontaine Papri reveal and what Purdue reveals all point to 408 BC when the work of the sanctuary was not only completed but restored. Let's chart this. From the going forth to not only build but to restore would be 457 and seven weeks would be 49 years using the day for a year principle. This would take us to 408 BC where the Lord's house was completed. While the final building process was taking place, there was troublous times for those building the walls. Indeed, a significant event did take place in 408 BC. The prophecy has been fulfilled to the very letter. This is not coincidence, but providential. The Lord knew all of this before it happened and told his servants the prophets. Now that we know the year when the temple was finished, let's find the exact month. So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of Elul. Elul is the 6th month. The Bible tells us that there was a dedication of the wall. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and with singing, with cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. It would make sense that the dedication would be the following month. If that is the case, that would be the seventh month, which is the exact month we began the prophecy, 49 complete full years from the beginning date. Remember that the sanctuary is the center of Jewish economy. It would make sense that this dedication would be in the same month as you find the atonement. All of these events seem to be lining up perfectly using the day for a year principle. In the next video, we are going to go into more detail with a 60 in two weeks. Let's remember why this is important to know and understand. Just as we learned the rebar is to make the foundation strong, prophecy is like a giant rebar to strengthen our faith. It reveals to us that we serve a God that knows the end from the beginning, that He has the power to set up and to take down kingdoms. When we see how the Lord revealed these things beforehand and they came to pass, it shows us that He is the great I Am. Remember that this prophecy is centered on Christ to point us down to the cross where He took the punishment for our sins.